From Fox 8 Sports, this is the Overtime Podcast. From the Fox 8 Studios in New Orleans, this is the Fox 8 Overtime Podcast. I am your host, Sean Vazan, riding shotgun as he does each and every podcast is Andre Johnson Jr. Before we get into today's content, be sure to like, share, rate, review. If you are watching us on YouTube, hit that subscribe notification or the subscribe button and get the notifications for whenever we drop that fire content here on this Wednesday. We have another great episode on the Overtime Podcast for you today. I, I, I'd be remiss, though, if I didn't acknowledge what's happening outside the building. And if you've watched Fox 8 all day today, and I don't know how you couldn't because we've been on all day, right. uh, Fox 8 is in a lot of intense weather coverage. I had a difficult time getting to work. I decided to make a run to grab some lunch before work today. That was a big mistake oh, because yeah. I couldn't just make it back to work. I barely got back here in time. But I had to take multiple de- detours because of the massive rain that has kept on falling, which has course in the city of New Orleans and Southeast Louisiana has led to flooding and there's been tornadoes in certain parts of the city. So it has been a bit of a messy day here in the city of New Orleans. Absolutely. I hope everybody is staying safe. I'm glad we all made it through this, but yeah, you know, on the way here, I was supposed to get here at about 30 yeah. Sean, I went to leave where I live. I got to the street completely underwater i turned right around i said yeah they probably don't need me for a few yeah. hours and it, you know it, in sports this is a very light day for us yeah. because there's so much weather coverage yeah. on tv they're like oh, we don't even need sports today so yeah, yeah we've just been relaxing we've just been kind of just kind of waiting up doing there to this see what they want for us. Research. yeah we're kind of doing this uh thing here um with the draft because that's the most important thing up next for the saints and look y'all are not um, it's not just you. It's not just us. It's been quiet around Saints camp. It, it yeah. just has been quiet. You know, the, the the rush of free agency has worn off. There's still some time before the draft. And I always say that little pocket of time when the free agency wears off and really before that last wave of all the last, you know, second draft stuff gets closer and closer. It is, it can get quiet. So it can almost feel like well, what's happening out there with the Saints. But now they're doing their draft due diligence. They're hard at work doing things. We've been attacking the draft from all angles and we teased this on monday the idea when we talked about brock bowers potentially being uh the saints pick at 14 if that were to happen and given the massive hole um, at not one but two tackle positions uh, they would have to turn to the second round or their next selection to Uh, basically acknowledge and select a tackle. So today, big picture, we want to go through, I guess you would call the next tier of tackles where if that scenario played itself out, who would be available? Right, and also shout out to everybody who commented on that video a lot. A lot lot of comments, a lot of people supporting the whole, you know, if Brock Bowers is there, we should Did that surprise you? Because it it surprised me a little bit how much in favor everyone seemed to be of Brock Bowers. I thought it would be a little more split. I was honestly more surprised that it wasn't more in favor of Brock Bowers because you did have a good amount of people who were also like, no, forget that. We need offensive line. And those people aren't wrong. Offensive line, Mm -hmm. the offensive tackle in general is definitely the Saints' Number one need. So, guys, like I said, keep commenting under those videos. If you have questions, comment them under the videos. You might see those questions in a later podcast. You never know. But as we get to our big picture, it is about the offensive tackles, the offensive linemen. Let's say for whatever reason, the Saints don't go with an offensive lineman in the first round. Now we look ahead to the second round. Who are some of the guys who would be available at pick 45 who can still give the Saints or fill that need that the Saints are going to have. Yeah, I've, I've gone through this scenario in my head because I've played out the Brock Bauer scenario so much. And in that Brock Bauer scenario, the next pick, if nothing else changes with the Saints, the tackle position has got to be a tackle. It has to yep. be a tackle. There's no questions asked. So if you're going to uh, acknowledge that the Saints have to have a tackle if you go away from tackle with their first selection, then who could potentially be available. I've gone through the mock draft simulators. I've done at least six or seven different uh, just kind of lists of you know top 100 graded prospects where the tackles land. And look, there's a lot of tackles, and some of these guys may have been first-round picks uh, in other drafts, but I have pinpointed three. 
three potential tackle prospects that could be available in the neighborhood of that second selection, which is at 45 in the second round. They are. Let's get to it. Arizona's Jordan Morgan, six foot five, three hundred eleven pounds. Houston's Patrick Paul, six foot seven and a half, three hundred thirty one pounds. And BYU's Kingsley Sua Matea, BYU, six foot five. 326 pounds. Now, I've gone through, like I said, the, the, the draft simulators, uh, the rankings. Why do I like these three guys? Well, each three, in my opinion, have three different skill sets that stand out where you can look at it if you're a franchise guy or if you're, a, you're looking for a guy that can play the position. They have a skill set. It's a little different, each one, but they have uh, things you can hang your hat on that are really good, uh, and they also have some deficiencies, which is why they would be available or potentially be available at this point in the draft. We'll start with Morgan, six foot five, three eleven. This guy has the most fluid feet and movement of any of these three. Yeah, and he plays like his kind of measurements would suggest: six foot five, three hundred eleven. Kind of a leaner tackle. When you see him moving laterally, he's very smooth. You see him going back, going forward. He's very smooth. Sometimes he's big guys. I mean, it's hard to look that smooth when you're talking right. about uh, having to move in quick, you know, move in you know short spaces in a very quick amount of time. The move back and forth and this and that and keep your balance. I think he was easily uh, the guy that had the most fluidity of all those guys, and that really stood out to me in particular with this offense that's going to rely on more agile, more athletic, I guess you could call it leaner um, offensive lineman that could certainly move. That really was something that stood out. He had a really good game last year against USC. He had a really good game last year against Washington. There was a twist that they ran uh, where the tackle looped around and the, in, and, the, and the outside guy ran in, and you know Morgan's on the edge, and he's got a go in to, to the tackle, and he's got to recover to get it back out to the left side for the loop coming around. So fluid, so fluid. But there is a flaw, and mm -hmm. the flaw is in his length. Only 32-inch yep. arms. And there are times where, and they, oh, with 32-inch arms, 33-inch arms, but when he goes up against a longer-length tackle, you see that lack of length because the DN's hand gets on him quicker, and sometimes that can lead to a lack of leverage. So that would be the only drawback, and that's why some have projected him potentially to kick inside at guard. But he has played tackle, almost all left tackle at Arizona. He had a really good week at the Senior Bowl. So Jordan Morgan, to me, is someone that I like. Did you have anything, anything to add on Jordan oh, Morgan? Oh, yeah, for sure. And with a lot of these guys, there's always going to be a but, you yeah. know, because if he was all good, we wouldn't be talking exactly. about getting him in the second round. But Jordan Morgan... He tore his ACL in 2022, mm -hmm. his junior or his third uh, college football season. Mm -hmm. Tore his ACL, came back in 2023, started all the games, and was able to make first team all Pac-12 and what was a pretty competitive Pac-12. It really was year. a good year for Pac-12 football. Exactly. So that's impressive to me, seeing that he can bounce back from one of the worst injuries that you can get mm -hmm. in any sport. Like you mentioned, he's athletic. He's got fast hands. You know, a lot of scouts believe that his athleticism is his strength. Mm -hmm. They say he could probably stand to get a little stronger, but mm -hmm. that athleticism, that fast hands, it makes him a really good run uh, run blocker. Yeah. And when you talk about the QBX system, like you mentioned, it's all about being able to have mobility and being able to have versatility. That's what Jordan Morgan has. Only allowed two sacks last season. You know, we talk about how great of a run blocker he is, but even in pass coverage, he yeah. allowed two sacks. So Jordan Morgan at Arizona, he's he's got shorter arms than maybe some mm -hmm. people would like. He's not as strong as a lot of people would like, but that athleticism, that speed, that able to get out, the ability to get out there and do what he's got to do, that puts him in the second round. Yeah. And that puts him potentially on the Saints' radar. Yeah, and I saw him at the Senior Bowl. I, I I kept my eye on him quite a bit. His ability to get to the second level, to the linebacker level quickly and smoothly and allowing a back to cut right behind him. It really stood out. So I, I actually was a fan. If he were available in that second round, I could see the Saints liking Jordan Morgan. Up next, Patrick Paul. He's the longest of all of them. Yep. Six foot seven, 331 pounds. That was his measurements at the combine. 36 and a quarter arms. So six seven, 331, uh, 36. So he is long. 44 starts at left tackle for the Houston Cougars. Length equals Leverage. If you know how to use your length, you can have great leverage uh, when it comes to playing on the edge at offensive tackle. Not everybody is quite as well versed in truly utilizing that length. And at Houston, he played against some decent pass rush guys. Didn't play against a lot of decent edge pass rush guys. But 
I do think if his length could turn into, if he understands how to utilize his length, he could be a very good guy on the end in terms of how he utilizes his leverage. He is a little bit raw despite 44 starts because he played at the University of Houston and didn't see a whole lot of getting to the second level. And you talk about run blocking yeah. for a guy like Patrick Paul and also this. It's the one thing I didn't like, and I saw it at the Senior Bowl. They didn't, they're not really calling it a lot at the Senior Bowl, but, man, is he handsy. You mm -hmm. can watch it where his hands get outside, gets under those pads, or he's hooking, and, sorry, man, you're on the edge like that in the NFL. Those oh, flags yeah, are coming. You are going to lead the league in holding penalties. But I do think he's a guy that could provide good value in the second round, um, and he's a guy that I think he's got a lot of experience under him, uh, but coming from Houston, hopefully he would also be pretty eager to learn. But you can't teach length, you can't coach length, uh, and he's played a lot of college football. He's the most interesting prospect that we're going to talk about today mm -hmm. because he's been called by many the best pass protector yeah. in this entire draft, yeah. including the guys that we talked about a few podcasts ago in the first round. Mm -hmm. Only allowed one sack all last year, and they ran an air raid type offense yep. at Houston, so they were throwing the ball a lot. Mm -hmm. To only allow one sack in an offense like that, very impressive. Like you said, he's got the stuff you can't teach, the length, the strength, the athleticism. So hearing all that, you're probably thinking, well, if he's the best pass protector, mm -hmm. if he's got all of these things, why isn't he graded in the first round? And it's what you alluded to. His run blocking. His run blocking has been the big question mark. And you could maybe say, you know, in the type of offense they ran at Houston, maybe he didn't get a lot of work in that. Maybe he didn't get a lot of opportunities to show what he can do in the run game. He'll definitely get those in the NFL, so we'll see where it is. But to me, the upside and the ceiling for a guy like yep. Patrick Paul is very high because of the natural skills that he acquired in a very unique offense at Houston and the physical tools that he has that you just can't teach. You can't teach that length. I mean, you just can't. I mean, think about that on the basketball court. Six foot right. seven, 331, with that kind of agility and that ability Pelicans to move. Pelicans can use that. I mean, look, yeah, absolutely. A guy that uh, could certainly move. Um, and I got to say, it, it's become the more frust one of the more frustrating things that I, that I see when it comes to watching college football is you just don't see any diversity in the run game. And it's mm -hmm. just, it's one running play. And if you're coming out of one of these air raid offenses like all this, shotgun, it's all shotgun pistol. and it's and it's it's an inside zone play where you're just you're just not moving anybody. So that could be a little hard from a projection standpoint because of the way the run game has really gone in the college football game. All right, moving on. Uh, our third and final candidate. And if you guys have anyone else to suggest, leave it in the comments below or leave your comments about these three guys here today. As we mentioned, Kingsley. Sua Matea, six foot five, three hundred twenty-six pounds, thirty-four and a quarter arms. So, right in the middle there in terms of uh, height and length between Morgan and Paul. Twenty-three starts at BYU, twelve at right tackle, eleven at left tackle. Had an injury last year, missed the bowl game. Out, six foot five, three twenty-six. If you look at him, just physically look at him, he looks the thickest. He kind of plays the thickest. He's got violent hands. Yep. There's a play uh, in one game. My goodness, I forgot the the opponent they were playing, but he's blocking the guy kind of around the edge, and he wants to bury the dude. Like he's Trevor Penning style, just wants to bury the guy into the ground. Uh, I don't know if he's the quickest guy in the world on the edge on the island. I think he's a guy. He's got powerful hands that can certainly help in situations. He's a guy that certainly feels like he would embrace the run game. Um, does it fit? the new style of offensive lineman that the Saints want. Now, to be fair, Kubiak has never come out and said exactly what he looks for in a tackle from a dimension and prototype standpoint, but just from past experience and what we've seen from these past linemen, does he exactly fit? Can he work his way into being that more agile guy as opposed to more of that mauler, uh, overly violent, physical type player? Um, I do think that is up for debate. He had a really decent Senior Bowl week, we watched quite a bit of him as well. Again, he played left tackle. He played right tackle in college. Um, but I do think if he's around and the other guys aren't, and that's someone that the Saints could potentially look at because I do think he's a guy that could eventually be a starter in the NFL. He is the most physically imposing of the three guys that we've talked about. His explosiveness and his power, especially in the power, run game. No doubt. That cannot be denied. Just turn on the tape. You'll yeah. see it. Now, there are many scouts that believe he can work on his pass protection, and there's still a little to be desired in mm -hmm. that area. But we just talked about having the stuff that you can't teach. Mm -hmm. The physicalness, the, the explosiveness, the power that I mentioned, you can't teach that. 
athleticism is a big part of his game. Now, he's a bit raw compared mm-hmm. to maybe the other two that we've seen. He hasn't played as much football. You mentioned he only started 23 games. Mm-hmm. But having started at left tackle, having started at right tackle, the Saints right now are a team that really doesn't have a clear vision for either mm-hmm. of those positions. So having that kind of versatility is a plus. Having that kind of athleticism is a plus. Now it's going to take a really good offensive line coach to take that raw talent and mold him into a potential all pro. But the raw talent is for sure there when you talk about Kingsley Sua Mateo. And I had to tell you, I was up there for Mobile for the Senior Bowl. He he really turned some heads from a guy that I don't know how how high on radars he was to a guy that you know worked his well worked his way into the discussion. And then the point about left tackle and right tackle is an interesting one because he played equal amount right tackle, left tackle, 12 at right, 11 at left. So not exactly equal, but close enough. Yeah. I remember asking James Hurst last year, the most versatile lineman the Saints had, a guy that played all over the, all over the line of scrimmage. I said, how hard is it to go from guard to tackle and tackle a guard, one rep this, one rep that? He goes, the position is not the issue. It's actually harder for me to go from left to right. Mm-hmm. As it is to, as opposed to just left guard, left tackle, it's hard to go left tackle, right tackle because you know everything gets gets shifted and reversed, and takes a special talent to be able to do that. And if he's got uh, experience doing both, he doesn't necessarily have to be trained on one. For instance, Patrick Paul is exclusively a left tackle, played all left tackle in college, right. so that versatility uh, could certainly help his game at the next level, in particular a team like the Saints that have always valued versatility, especially when it comes to offensive linemen. Now, when it comes to acquiring these guys, if it were to come to this, we're talking about pick 45. (laughs) That's where the Saints are right now. Mm. But if the Saints opt to not choose an offensive lineman with number 14, their first-round draft pick, Mm -hmm. could you see a potential trade happening to maybe even move into the back of that first round, earlier in the second round? How, how would you see them potentially wheel or deal to get these offensive linemen if they start coming off the board a little quicker? I'm going to make a prediction right now. Okay. Okay. Me too. If the 14th pick in the NFL draft comes around and the Saints select someone other than a tackle, I guarantee you mm. they will move up in the second round from 45 to either get back into the first round or move up higher in the second round to get a tackle, their highest graded tackle on the board. They are not going to let that slip and wait all the way to pick 45. They're not going to hope and pray and, hey, let's just see if one of our guys lands to us. If they pick someone other than a tackle at 14, I truly believe the Saints will then be prepared to move up for their next selection, whether that's, you know, 45 to like 36, whether that's a, well, that's, excuse me, that's 45 to 29 back in the first round with a next year's first round pick, whatever the case may be, the Saints will not wait till 45 to select that tackle. They are going to go up and get that player because at that point, the need becomes too much and they have to get that player. And they're not just going to sit on their hands and hope one of those guys fall at 45. And that's very interesting because let's say you move up to 29, like you said. Mind you, there's already a big 105 pick difference between their second round pick and the pick after that, which Mm -hmm. is already in the fifth. So 105 picks between round two and round five, they're looking at right now. You move even further up, that gap only widens. So it's a very interesting uh, maybe even sacrifice, you can say, that the Saints would have to make. But ultimately, you got to get your guy. And I think right now they're locked in on offensive line in the first round unless the scenario happens that we talked about earlier this week mm-hmm. and somebody who is so talented or so high on their board is available yeah. that you just simply cannot say no. So let's say you pick that guy. Your number one needs still offensive linemen. And you don't just want any offensive lineman. You want an offensive lineman that you believe in and that you have graded very high. And that can play pretty quickly. Exactly, because they may have to. Yeah. You may have to start one, you know, day one, yeah. potentially, especially if Ryan Ramchick can't go. So moving up, I like the logic behind it. It's it's going to take, you know, maybe a little bit. You know, you mentioned the first round from next year. That's definitely a blow. But right now, I mean, you need offensive line help, and the draft is the best place to find it. And that's why, and we're going to have a prod on this tomorrow, you know, the early trade back scenario is not a bad scenario this year. Yeah. It's one of the few years where you can honestly say it makes sense. We're going to get into some possible 
uh, what a trade back, what possible trade back scenario slash offers would look like if you're the Saints or not. That's really the one where we want y'all's take on whether or not it would be a good selection or a good uh, deal for the Saints to take to kind of smooth out that draft board, not have that hollow middle uh, right in the middle from third and fourth round where there's no selections and only first to second in the back, the seven after pick 150. Um, just real quick before I get out of here, um, you watch the tape, I watch the tape, just kind of great, like. If I had my pick of these three, it would be Jordan Morgan. I just think he's the best fit from a uh, skill set standpoint, what this new regime is going to want out of that position. I know he's not quite as long as you would like, but I do think his balance and fluidity and his ability to get to the second and third level would make up for that, and you can really do a lot with that guy. Um, So to me, if I were kind of ranking the three, number one would be Jordan Morgan for me. I think right now, today, he's probably the best. But ironically, if I were to pick one today, I would pick Patrick Ball. Okay. Because I think his ceiling's the highest. I think that his ability and what he can do in the pass protection game is miles ahead of the other two guys. Mm -hmm. I think his experience. length, man. Exactly. the, The length, the physicality, the stuff you can't teach. I think that puts his ceiling so high. And he's gonna take some, he's gonna need some coaching. He's gonna need somebody to help him figure out that run game and figure out you know, the situations that he wasn't necessarily put in at Houston mm-hmm. because of the style of offense they ran. But if the Saints can do that for him, I think he can potentially be a better offensive lineman than the other two. But what you said about Jordan Morgan, I think right now, just as an overall offensive tackle, he's probably the number one guy. Just when I watch him, I, I can just visualize him in this outside zone, kind of zone scheme that the Saints are inevitably going to run, and hopefully he can get coached up and – uh Whoever the Saints go with, uh, obviously it'll be a huge pick for the Saints at a very, very, very important position and, frankly, a vulnerable vulnerable position for the Black and Gold. Struggling right. to talk today. It's been a crazy day, no doubt about it. Anything else for us today? Leave those comments, guys. We definitely, I believe me, we read the comments. We look at them. We do. Sometimes we have little conversations in the sports office. When Based we're off those com- comments, yes. Literally. Hey, hey, so leave the comments. We may talk about them here. Your comment may start a whole new podcast topic. Who knows? So I, 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 No doubt about yeah, it. Leave no those comments, it. and we will read them. And if you're in New Orleans, stay home. Let yes. those floodwaters recede a little bit, and Watch hopefully the weather is good for the rest of the week, and we can enjoy uh, another weekend in the city of New Orleans or wherever you might be. That'll do it for us. For Andre Johnson Jr., I am Sean Fazan. We'll catch you guys next time on Overtime.